Hello friends, this week on 3ABN Sabbath School panel, we're continuing our study on this quarterly's lesson entitled Rest in Christ. And we're in week four, and this week we're going to be talking about the cost of rest. And you know what, you may be new to set 3ABN Sabbath School panel, and you may want to join us in our study and may not have a copy of the quarterly. And so we want to tell you how you can get a copy of that study right now. Uh, there's a couple of ways you can do that. We always want to encourage you to go to your local Seventh-day Adventist church where you can engage in personal Bible study, in-person Bible study with brothers and sisters in Christ who are like-minded. And of course, if you can't do that, then you can simply go online to absg.adventist.org. Again, that's absg.adventist.org. So buckle up and get ready because we're going to be diving deep into the Bible to learn more about how we can rest in Christ. Hello, friends, and welcome back to another edition of 3ABN Sabbath School Panel. And as always, we're so thankful that you are joining us because each and every week we break open the Bible, we take on a new lesson, and we learn so much. And so my name is Ryan Day, and I would like to take the opportunity to introduce the rest of our family panel, and then we'll get right into our lesson. To my direct left is Pastor John Lomaking. Always a blessing to have you, brother. Good to be here. We have been enjoying this lesson about rest and been learning that rest is something that's found in various ways, so it's good to be a part of this one too. Just stay tuned. Amen. God has something in store for you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Then we have Miss Shelley Quinn next to you. How are you, sister? I'm doing very well, thank you, and very excited to be here. Amen. Praise the Lord. And then Miss Jill Morricone, always a blessing, and we know you have that special list for us today. <laughs> <laughs> today we have seven experiences after confession. Mm. Praise the Lord. Praise <laughs> the Lord. Thank you. Amen. And way down there at the end of the table, but certainly not last, Brother Kenny Shelton. It's always a blessing to have you, brother. Blessing to be here and share God's word. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Amen. Praise the Lord. This week, lesson number four in mm -hmm. our study on rest in Christ. Uh, we're going to be talking about the cost of rest. There oh. is a cost associated for having that special spiritual rest in Jesus Christ. But before we get into our study, we always need to invite the Holy mm -hmm. Spirit to lead and guide us in this study. And so, Sister Shelley, would you have a prayer for us? Absolutely. Our glorious Heavenly Father, how we praise you and thank you for your plan of salvation by grace, for Jesus Christ, for your Holy Spirit and your word. And Lord, now as we open your word, we pray for your anointing on us, on our minds, that you would speak through us. And Lord, give us all ears to hear yes. what the Holy amen. Spirit has to say in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Mm, amen. Amen. Thank you so much. So I'm going to jump right into our memory text, which to me is one of my favorite texts. In fact, it's one of my favorite scripture songs to sing. And then, of course, that's Psalm chapter 51, mm. verse 10. Of course, yeah. this is those powerful words coming from the repentant heart yeah. of King David as he speaks out and says, again, Psalm 51, verse 10. He says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit or a steadfast mm -hmm. spirit within me. And so I, I always like to find a, a little bit of a nugget, something that you can find within the study itself without having to read the entire study. But every once in a while, I, I, there's something just so profound and so nice in there that I just have to just read it word for That's word. Right. And I always like to take take that to do that because yeah. the writers worked so hard to produce mm -hmm. these lessons. And um, I, I enjoyed reading the beginning part of Sabbath afternoon study because it has this to say. It says, many people seem desperate to find a little peace and quiet. Mm -hmm. They are willing to pay for it too. In many big cities, there are internet free rooms which can be hired by the hour. Well. <laughs> the rules are strict, no noise, no visitors. Mm -hmm. People are willing to pay to be able to sit quietly and just think or nap. Well. There are sleep pods that can be hired in airports and noise reducing earphones are popular items. <laughs> there are even canvas hoods or collapsible privacy shields that you can buy to pull over your head mm -hmm. and torso for a quick workplace break. And I, as I was reading through that list, you know, a couple of them I've heard of, but a few of those I've never ever heard of these things. Yeah. And apparently people will do a lot these days just for a little peace and quiet. Yeah. And as the lesson brings out, sometimes you have to pay for these things yes. because oftentimes 
rest comes at a cost. And that certainly is the same concept as we look into how to rest in Christ. Uh, it comes at a cost. And we're going to talk about that today in our lesson. I want to go right directly into Sunday's lesson because this actually helps to set the, 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 the framework, the groundwork for what we're going to be talking today. King David is a primary example of how we can have rest in Christ, but sometimes... Uh, you know, something can happen that can cause that rest to cease in which we now have to go back and we have to plead mm. at the throne of grace and say, Lord, I want to be in your rest. I want to restore that rest in you. That was certainly the truth in King David's situation. And so what I want to do is I want to go directly to the scripture. So let's find ourselves in 2 Samuel chapter 11. In fact, the bulk of what I'm going to be studying today or reading from is 2 Samuel chapter 11. We're going to start at the very beginning. This is a story that many of us have probably heard many times, but I suspect that there's someone watching at home right now that may have never heard this story mm -hmm. before. And there are certain, certainly some lessons we can learn uh, from this. And so, 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 1 through 5, the Bible says, It happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle. Notice that. Well, when kings go out to battle, right? Yes. That David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. So I just want to just highlight that for a moment. This is the Bible's bringing out that this is usually a time of the year when kings go out to battle. But in this particular case, and, and I don't think anyone's going to argue that King David is, is one of the great military minds uh, in, in God's kingdom and God's people, especially his nation. And so it goes on to say that David remained in Jerusalem during this time when perhaps maybe he would have normally been out with his, with his men mm -hmm. battling uh, in this case. But it goes on to say in verse 2, then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman. And someone said, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers and took her. And she came to him, and he lay with her, for she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house. And the woman conceived. So she sent and told David and said, I am with child. So no, no, no. I have to just say, again, this is one of those stories. You just, have, you just read it. You can't help but just say, this is one twisted story. <laughs> but yet it is often in these twisted stories that we read that we learn so many incredible lessons. Yeah. And in this case, David, as the Bible describes, was a man after God's own heart. And even though he falls into this dreadful sin, which we're going to talk about in further de detail, we're going to see that that man after God's own heart, he saw his sin, he repented of that sin, and he mm -hmm. was able to restore that rest in Christ. Yeah. But I just have to make mention here that, again, uh, the cost of rest here, I don't think that maybe the, the, the lesson, the person who wrote the lesson intended for this to be so, or maybe they did. But the idea would be here that I caught from this is that there's a time, you know, the Bible talks about there's a time for this and there's a time for that yes. and there's a season for this. In this case, there's a time when kings should be out to battle and there's a time when kings should be at rest. And this time was probably a time right. when David should not have been at rest mm -hmm. because he found himself atop this roof and he found himself obviously making the wrong choice, mm -hmm. which would cause a domino effect, a snowball effect of things that I'm sure, obviously looking back on, he, he would have done differently, mm -hmm. uh, obviously, if it had not have been done that way. So that being said, let's go on in the scripture, verse 6, I'll continue in the story yeah. here. It says, then David sent to Joab saying, send me Uriah the Hittite. Again, Uriah is the husband of Bathsheba. And so he says, mm -hmm. go send for him. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah had come to him, David asked how Joab was doing and how the people were doing and how the war prospered. And David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah departed from the king's house and a gift of food from the king followed him. Now you could just imagine in this, you could just imagine, David has stepped out of grace at this moment. He's not really thinking straight because he's already been tempted and conceived that thought, that idea, and he has acted upon it. And now he's committed sin. And so in this case, you know, he's not thinking clearly. And so much so that now he begins to plan and to plot how he can somehow get out 
out of this. Mm -hmm. And a part of his plan is, you know what, I'm going to bring Uriah back here. I'm going to say, hey, brother, why don't you, you've been working hard. Yeah. You've been out there oh. doing a good job. Get on back to your house. Mm -hmm. Rest up and let me send you some goodies back with you. Mm -hmm. You've been a good boy, right? And, and, and so it didn't actually turn out the way David was hoping. Yeah. Notice what the Bible says in verse 9. Oh, but Uriah slept at the door of the king's house mm -hmm. with all the servants of his Lord and did not go down to his house. So when they told David, saying, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, did you not come from a journey? Why do you not go down to your house? Yes. And Uriah said to David, look, the ark and Israel and Judah are dwelling in tents. Mm -hmm. And my Lord Joab and his servants of my Lord are encamped in the open fields. Mm -hmm. Shall I then go to my house to eat and drink and to lie with my wife mm -hmm. as you live and as your soul lives? I will not do this thing. So Uriah takes the honorable route. He says, look, yeah. you know, the ark of God's covenant. It's over there in a the tent. My brothers are in the field fighting a bad one. They're all sleeping on the ground in the fields. How can I in my right mind do, you know, just go back home and lay with my wife and you just act like everything's not going on that's happening. We're in battle. We're in war. I'm going to sleep at the Lord's house. And so uh, that was, that was number two, right? Or that was actually number one. Now he's going to try his attempt number two. Notice verse 12. Mm -hmm. It says, then David said to Uriah, wait here today also, and tomorrow I will let you depart. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. Now, when David called him, he ate, he drank before him, and he, and he made him drunk. So get this, I'm going to uh -oh. make him drunk. Uh -oh. And at evening, he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. Uh -oh. So I'm going to try to make this brother drunk. This is going to be his, his, his mm. second attempt here now to try to cause uh, Uriah to fall back, uh, in, in, you know, in, in, so he can kind of just brush over the sin. Mm -hmm. Again, David's not thinking right. Why? Because he's no longer resting mm -hmm. in that uh -huh. gracious right. relationship relationship with God. He has succumbed to sin. And so now we go on to verse 14. It says, in the morning, it happened that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. Right. <laughs> and he wrote it in the letter saying, set Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retreat from him that he may be struck down and die. Right. So it was that while Joab besieged the city that he assigned Uriah to place where he, a uh, place where he knew there were valiant men. And when the men of the city came out and fought with Joab and some of the people of the servants of David fell and Uriah the Hittite died also. Mm. So when you think this story could get any more twisted, right? Mm. David's like, look, you know, I'm going to send a letter. And he sends the letter by the very person that he's plotting against. Yeah. This brother's carrying his death sentence oh. and doesn't realize it. But again, this is, this is the idea, my friends. This is what sin does to you. When, yeah. you, when, you uh, when you entertain sin and you entertain the temptations of the enemy, this is exactly even powerful men, mighty men, mm. righteous men, in, in this case of David, can fall in this case. And that's exactly mm. what we're seeing here. And so the Bible goes on to say in verse 18, uh, actually it's going down to verse 22. It says, so the messenger went and came and told David all that Joab had sent by him. So they've returned to give him the report. And the messenger said to David, surely the men prevailed against us and came out to us in the field, but we drove them back as far as the entrance of the gate. The archers shot from the wall at your servants and some of the king's servants are dead. Mm. And your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. Oh. Mm. And, and it's interesting, David, David's response, again, not thinking clearly. Yeah. Mm. He's almost like he gives him like this pat on the back, says, there, there, everything's going to be okay. Because he responds with, in verse 25, mm. thus you shall say to Joab, do not let this thing displease you. For the sword devours one as well as another. Strengthen your attack against the city and overthrow it. So encourage him. We look through all of this and we see that because David was, again, not in the field where he should have been, but he was resting back home, he, it caused him to fall from the spiritual rest that he had in Christ. Mm -hmm. And now he has committed this horrible sin that, again, just created this snowball effect, one thing after another, of David not thinking clearly mm -hmm. and him making decisions that would ultimately cost him to a great degree. Yeah. And so in this case, and I love, I, love, uh, I love a note that I made here. It says, oftentimes our rest can lead to decisions and behaviors that displeases the Lord. And sometimes oh. <laughs> let us always remain connected to the vine, examining ourselves in the Lord mm -hmm. and make sure that we know when it is time to rest. In this case, uh -huh. we need to make sure we're always resting in Jesus Christ. So how is David going to bring himself back in harmony mm -hmm. with Jesus Christ? Well, that, the rest of the story is going to come, and I'm going to kick it to Pastor Loma King at this wow, time. Wow, you laid the foundation yeah. beautifully. Mm -hmm. This is an amazing story, a heart-wrenching mm -hmm. story about mm -hmm. David, the man that God called that fell into sin, tried to cover his transgression, and then now 
he feels no one knows about it, but God always has some way to get our attention. Mine is entitled, yeah. Wake Up Call. Mm -hmm. Mm -mm. And we go to 2 Samuel chapter 12, mm -hmm. beginning with verse 1. Mm -hmm. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said to him, there were two men in one city, and this is talking about how to communicate in a parabolic way, how to find a back door to a person's heart that's full of authority yeah. because you can't come straight out and say, to you, I know what you did. Nathan knew David well. Mm -hmm. He knew how to speak to David. And the Lord gave him the skill of a man who was familiar with David's heart, but the fortitude and the integrity of a prophet who had to tell David exactly what God wanted mm -hmm. him to know. Mm. So we use a parable, and let's go and look at the parable that he uses. There were two men in one city. I'm in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 1. One rich and the other poor, verse 2. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing <laughs> except one little ewe lamb, which he had brought and nourished, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It ate, it, it ate of his own food and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom. And it was like a daughter to him. Mm. And a traveler came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one of the wayfaring men who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and presented it mm. and prepared it oh. for the man who had come to him. So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die. Uh -oh. And he shall restore fourfold for the lamb. I could hear David now telling him, man, this is something <laughs> terrible. Yeah. He's becoming righteous now <laughs> by trying to cover his sin. Because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Mm. Then Nathan said to David, boom, wow. you are the man. Yeah. Thus mm. says the Lord mm. God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered to you from the hand of Saul. I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I also would have given you much more. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord mm -hmm. to do evil in his sight? Oh. And then he re repeats what, what Ryan brought out very carefully. He plotted the, the death of Uriah, mm. uh, Bathsheba's husband. Mm -hmm. And it didn't, it, you know, you didn't get to this part, but if you look at 2 Samuel mm -hmm. chapter 11, verse 26, it says, mm -hmm. when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her right. husband, was dead. She mourned for her husband. That's right. But what did David do? Verse 27, and when her mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, uh -huh. and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. That's right. Yes. You know, there, are, there is sin and there is reckoning. And yeah. th we're going to now begin to look at not only what happened, uh, but what happened to David mm -hmm. prior and what happened to David afterward. Mm -hmm. Now, David was a man who sought to hide his own transgression. He sought to do it legitimately. He sought to do it legislatively. Mm -hmm. He sought to do it with power in his hand. Mm -hmm. But there's one mightier than all of us mm -hmm. yes. who brings us to accountability. Yeah. Oh, and this was so vitally important because mm -hmm. you know that the, pre the precursors to any kind of repentance is you've got to really be sorrowful for that yes. sin. Yes. You can't find deliverance from sin by saying, you know, Shelley, I apologize. Well. I hope that's good enough. <laughs> mm. And some people say things like, well, if I offended you, uh -huh. I'm really sorry that I did. David had no corner. God had taken all the corners yes. in his life and lit them up. Right. And he had to now come to accountability. Yes. This is where now we go to mm -hmm. Psalm chapter, fi chapter 51. Mm. I want to bring out three points before we go to Psalm 51 about sin, what sin does. Because you notice what Nathan said, Nathan talked about not just uh, the taking of Uriah's life and the stealing of Uriah's wife and impregnating her, but, but he said, this, this thing displeased the Lord. That's right. Mm -hmm. First and foremost, all sin is a sin against God. That's mm -hmm. right. Go back to Joseph, what he said, how can I do this great yes. wickedness and sin against God? Mm -hmm. why, is, why is all sin a sin against God? Because the commandments are the commandments of God. Mm -hmm. And when we violate the commandments of God, we're transgressing against the character of God, the mm -hmm. standard set by God, even though it injures individuals, the one that is being offended directly mm -hmm. yeah. is the Lord who establishes yeah. the standard. Mm -hmm. That's why the first thing, if you love me, keep my commandments, but David chose not to do it. So therefore it was an offense, not only that injured Uriah and his wife mm -hmm. and led to his death, 
unfortunately, but it was an injury directly against the God mm -hmm. who had placed him in that position, and now God called David yeah. to accountability. Mm -hmm. Sin injures the family as well as sin injures also could be broadly the yeah. church, the community. James 5 and verse 16, the Bible says, Confess your trespasses oh. to one another. But don't just do that. Pray for one another. Mm that you may be healed. Mm -hmm. This is not private prayer. And this that James is talking about here is come to the person that you offended. Go to the individual that has been right. injured by your sin. Confess to that individual. That, in, that individual confesses to you if it's a, it's a dual party transgression. Mm -hmm. And then you pray for one another so that both of you can experience healing. David needed not only forgiveness, David mm. needed something more than that. Right. And that th that's why the Bible says, the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. But also, sin drives another nail into the hand of Jesus. We often don't see that. Hebrews 6, verse 4 to 6. Mm -hmm. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened yeah. and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good of the Word of God mm -hmm. and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son mm -hmm. of God and put him to an open shame. Yeah. David's sin put God to an open shame. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Going on further, number five, or number four, sin separates. Isaiah 59 and verse two, mm -hmm. but your iniquities have mm -hmm. separated you from your God mm -hmm. and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. I know that if David said to the Lord, okay, okay, I messed up. Oh, well, we've got some battles coming up. I just need uh -oh. some advice. Uh -oh. The Lord has said, I ain't talking to you. Mm -hmm. Do not talk to me. Mm -hmm. I'm not even listening to you. Get that thing right. Mm -hmm. That's where the iniquity, this wasn't just a, a, a momentary sin, David, uh, um, no pun intended, conceived the sin mm -hmm. and the sin itself conceived, mm -hmm. brought forth death, as James says, right. planned the death, plotted the death, mm -hmm. perpetrated the death, impregnated the man's wife, my, my. killed her husband. Oh. This was not an incidental thing. Right. No. This right. became a sin of his heart, a sin that took all the components of the strength that God had given to him mm -hmm and led him down a path of darkness. Yeah. And you know, sometimes you go down this path of darkness and when you get down the path, you said, how did I get here? Mm -hmm. And you try to cover your sin, but you cannot do it. So what are the remedies? Acts chapter two and verse 38. Mm -hmm. There are only a few remedies. That's good. Mm -hmm. That's right. Then Peter said to them, and this yes. applies yes. to David, yes. repent yes. and let every one of you be baptized yes. in the name of Jesus yes. Christ. Yes. I'm going to focus on the part repent. Yes. That's because right. without repentance, there is no forgiveness. Mm -hmm. You know, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But let me make a point here. Repentance is not something that happens outside of the presence of God in a person's life. Mm -hmm. Because admittance and repentance are not the same thing. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. you look at, this, look at the situation with um, Judas. Yeah. <laughs> he got caught. Uh, right. I, I have betrayed the Son of God, but did he repent? No. No. Mm. And there is this, what you call the lights on. I'm, I'm guilty. Okay, I did it. Oh. That is not repentance. Mm -hmm. God will not restore David until he came to the point of repentance. Yeah. Look at Psalm 51 and verse 1. Mm -hmm. Look at what he asked. And then I'm going to transition to Shelley because this is a story that mm -hmm. unfolds continually. Mm -hmm. And there are so many components. What's, what did David ask? Mm -hmm. Psalm 51 verse 1. Have mercy on me, O God, mm -hmm. according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, mm -hmm. and cleanse me from my sin. Why? Boy. For I acknowledge my transgressions, mm -hmm. and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Mm. Mm. He said, I'm guilty. I can't even argue with what I have done. I can't even find a way to even justly uh, dismiss what I've done. Mm. But let's go to 2 mm. Corinthians 7, verse 9 and 10. Look at this. How did David get to the point of repentance? Listen to this. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 9 and 10. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, mm -hmm. but that your sorrow led to repentance. Yes. Yes. For you were made sorry in a godly manner. He asked for that, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, mm -hmm. not to be regretted, 
but the sorrow of the world produces death. Yes. David could look back on a godly sorrow and a godly forgiveness and a godly repentance, and he could regret what he did, mm -hmm. but he can now rejoice in the transgressions being forgiven mm -hmm. and the Lord extending mercy to him. Amen. Mm. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor. Yes. Appreciate that. Folks, we're just getting started. <laughs> so we're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. Amen. Hello, friends, and welcome back to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. We're going to kick it over to Miss Shelley Quinn for Tuesday's lesson. Oh, thank you. I love my topic for Tuesday. It is forgiven and mm -hmm. forgotten. It's good. Um, we're going to continue in 2 Samuel chapter 12. Here, Nathan has come and told the story, and you know, the king could have lopped off his head, mm -hmm. but Nathan was so bold. So when David hears that this little ewe lamb was taken by a rich man and says, <laughs> off with his head, basically. Oh. You know, when Nathan said, you are the man, whew, he got David's attention. Now, here's what I want to point out to you. In 2 Samuel 12 and verse 13, when Nathan told David, you're the man, David says to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Yeah. Mm. And Nathan said to David, the Lord has put away your sin. You mm. shall not die. I propose to you that this is such condensed history. There's something that happened mm. before Nathan's response. And let me tell you why. Mm. In 2 Samuel 12, we're covering history in one chapter that's about 18 months. It goes through the first pregnancy of Bathsheba. It goes through the death of their child. Mm -hmm. It goes through the second pregnancy of Bathsheba. And then the birth of Solomon is announced in 2 Samuel 12, 24. Mm -hmm. So remember, this is a condensed history. That's things that people miss sometimes mm -hmm. when they're reading the Bible. So the repentant David from the time in 2 Samuel 12 when he says, oh, I've sinned against the Lord. Mm. In Psalm 51, mm -hmm. verses 1 through 4, here's the title of the psalm. Mm. It says the psalm of David when Nathan the prophet went to him mm -hmm. after he'd gone to Bathsheba. Mm. So what I am suggesting is that David says, I have sinned against the Lord. He's grieving. He goes into Psalm 51. Mm. He repents. He's serious. Then Nathan oh. says to him, the Lord has put away your sin. Mm -hmm. But let's read Psalm 51, 1 through 4 again, because, you know, if you aren't sure how to confess your sin, mm. if you're feeling kind of a separation between you and God. Mm -hmm. I encourage you, mm -hmm. get out your Bible mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. read Psalm 51 out loud mm -hmm. and pray it Ooh, to the Lord. Right. Mm -hmm. And here's what he says, have mercy mm -hmm. on me, O mm -hmm. God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Oh, blot out my transgressions. Mm -hmm. See, he knew yes. that God blotted out sin, that he covered mm -hmm. sin with the blood of the lamb. David knew the plan of salvation. Mm -hmm. Then listen to this. He says, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity mm -hmm. and cleanse me from my sin. Yes. He knew that that lamb at the sanctuary represented the coming Messiah, yes. by whose blood we would, would wash away our sins. And then he says this, I acknowledge my transgressions. Mm. My sin is always before me. You know what? Confession. First John 1, 9, if you confess your sins, mm. he's faithful mm. and just mm. to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Confession's a clearing house of the conscience. Well, <laughs> that's good. And then he says in verse 4, against you, you only have I sinned. Mm. You know, doesn't that remind you of Joseph when yes. it, well, Potiphar's well. wife was trying to get him to mm -hmm. lie with her? And he said, how could I do this yes. sin? 
commit adultery. How could I do this sin against God? He didn't say against Potiphar, against you, against God. Mm. So that's what David's saying. Against you, you only have I sinned, done evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. So what does it mean that God has taken away David's sin? Did he just wipe the slate clean? Mm. Did he just simply forget about it? <laughs> David's confession of sin was immediate. He did mm. not try to rationalize with oh. God. He didn't justify his sin. He knew his sin was horrible. Mm. And not only had he committed adultery, guilty of murder, manipulation, man, I'll tell you, you can probably list about five commandments mm -hmm. that he'd broken, but what does James say? Break one, break, break them all. all. So oh. he was very guilty. And his main uh, plea, of course, was to cleanse me. Mm -hmm. He had wrong. Don't get this, don't get me wrong. Well. He had wronged Uriah. He mm -hmm. had wronged oh, Bathsheba. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, his sin was against God's holy law mm. and therefore against God's character. Mm. When Nathan said, the Lord has put away your sin, you shall not die. Do you realize justice demanded David's death? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. Mm. But God right. showed him mercy mm. That's right. by sparing his life. Still, God has to protect his reputation. Mm -hmm. So sin had to be judged. And Bathsheba's baby, their first union, would die. Mm -hmm. Forgiveness of sin doesn't always remove the consequences of sin. Right. Mm -hmm. Only in the lifetime to come will that happen. Mm -hmm. And since David had violently had Uriah killed, his own house was to continually be plagued by violence. Mm -hmm. His son Amnon yeah. raped his own sister yeah. Tamar. Absalom murdered Amnon. Mm -hmm. Adonijah rebelled against his father. Mm -hmm. So poor David, yeah. mm -hmm. he suffered the consequences David. of yeah. sin even though he had God's love. Mm. Now this is interesting. In 1 Kings chapter 14 and verse 8, God tells the prophet to tell the wife of Jeroboam the king who has, she's come to him all cloaked in his disguise trying to find out what's going to happen with her husband. And in 1 Kings 14, 8, this is after, after David had died. God says, go tell Jeroboam, mm. you have not been like my servant David, mm -hmm. who kept my commandments well. and who followed me with all of his heart to only do what is right in my eyes. What? Mm -hmm. We just got through saying he's a <laughs> guilty of adultery. Yeah. He's guilty of murder. He's yeah. broken these commandments. <laughs> but God says, David <clears throat> did only he kept all my commandments, did only what was right in my eyes. Mm -hmm. To me, this absolutely proves that mm -hmm. God forgets what we ask him to forgive. But let That's me good. explain this. Mm, well. In the Bible, when it says God remembers something, it's not that he forgot it mm -hmm. and, oh, yeah, I forgot about that, like in Exodus 2, 24, when he hears the cries of the Hebrew children and it says, oh, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Mm -hmm. It didn't mean that God goes, oh, yeah. yeah right. well, I think I made those covenant promises. Mm -hmm. No, see, when, when the Bible says that God remembers, it means he's going to take action. That's right. It's good. The oh, Bible yes. says that God forgets. Mm -hmm. It means he's not taking mm -hmm. any action. So he... Uh, Isaiah 43 and verse 25, God says, mm. I, even I am he who blots out your That's transgressions. Right. Mm. He covered it with the blood mm. and he said, I've done it for my own sake. I don't want to think on it. Mm. He says, I will not remember mm. your sins. That's right. In other words, mm -hmm. I'm not going to act on it. Now, this is interesting. In 1 Kings, just one chapter 
after God has spoken this. And you know that, boy, the scribe has, I mean, when, this is exactly as God quoted it. But now, as the author of First mm -hmm. Kings is pulling it all together and mm -hmm. summarizing, he says this, because David did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and not had, had not turned aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, except mm. in the matter of Uriah the okay. Hittite. Mm. 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 See, God's not trying to cover the record of our sin mm. from the world. It doesn't mean your reputation is going to be restored right away. Mm -hmm. but God will blot out That's your good. transgressions. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Shelley. Yes. Each one of you, a powerful story, yeah. powerful lesson. To me, incredible hope yes. that each Amen. one of us have. We're going back to Psalm 51. I have six verses here. We're in Psalm 51. We're going to look at verses 7 through 12. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're reading through the book of Psalms, and I love the book of Psalms, um, when we get to Psalm 51, this is the fourth um, and the best known of the what we call the penitential Psalms in the book of Psalms. Just meaning this is confession of sin. This David's confession of sin is probably unmatched in scripture. Amen. If you go through and Amen. you read this. Interestingly, this verses 7 through 12, which is my portion, it parallels the new covenant experience Amen. that we find in Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel promises cleansing. David asks for cleansing. Mm -hmm. Ezekiel promises a new heart. David asks for a pure heart. Mm. Ezekiel promises a new spirit. David asks for a steadfast spirit. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I told you at the beginning, mm -hmm. there are seven experiences that you and I can have as Christians following confession. Shelley did an incredible job talking about that confession of sin, repentance, asking for forgiveness. And we have the seven experiences. I'm going to give you the seven and then we'll go back and unpack them. Mm -hmm. Number one is cleansing from sin. Yeah. Number two is assurance of forgiveness and salvation. Mm -hmm. Number three is joy in Jesus. Mm -hmm. Number four is recreation. Number five is renewal. Number six is experiencing Christ's presence. And number seven is victory that comes from the Holy Spirit. So let's look okay. at those seven. We have cleansing from sin. We're in Psalm 51 verse seven. David's pouring out his heart before God. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Mm -hmm. That word purge literally means unsin me. Mm. Do you want to be unsinned? Do you want it to be <laughs> like Lord. that sin Amen. does not <laughs> exist. And that it's like as if you had never sinned. Unsin yes. me with hyssop. Hyssop, of course, was a plant that they used in cleansing rituals in the sanctuary service. A bunch of hyssop would be dipped in blood and applied for that sin. It reminds me of Isaiah 118. God is speaking, come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Good, Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they're red like crimson, they shall be as wool. The blood of Jesus cleanses our scarlet sins and it turns it white. I don't even understand that. How the red blood of Jesus turns my red sin, turns it white. I love that. Yes. And if you look at the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 9, there's this whole concept of Hebrews 9, 12 to 14. It's not the blood of goats and bulls or calves. But with his own blood, yes. he right. entered the most right. holy place once for all having obtained eternal redemption. Mm. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, Amen. who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Amen. So do you want to be unsinned? Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash Amen. me. 
and I shall be whiter than snow. Experience number two is the assurance of forgiveness and salvation. Or in Psalm 51, we're going to jump forward a couple verses to verse 12. Restore to me the joy of your salvation mm -hmm. and uphold me by your generous spirit. Amen. Do you have confidence in your salvation? Do you have assurance that if you died today, you will be in the kingdom of heaven when Jesus comes again? Do you have that assurance? I lived years of my life mm -hmm. not knowing. Would I be saved or lost? Would I be good enough for God to accept? I know there are many Christians of many different denominations who do not have assurance of salvation. Mm. Sometimes we feel unsure because we know we're guilty yes. and we clearly know that we need to be forgiven. Sometimes we feel unsure because we don't understand scripture mm -hmm. or the fact that we're saved by grace through faith and we think somehow we have to work harder or be better mm -hmm. or do something to merit God's favor. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it might be because we can't point to a specific time in the past. This is when I accepted Jesus mm -hmm. and it was a gradual experience. Mm -hmm. And so we say, maybe I'm not saved because I can't identify a specific moment. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's because we just walk by how we feel yeah. instead of by faith in what the Word of God says. What does the Word of God say? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, by grace, grace. you have been saved through faith. Yeah. And that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works lest anyone should boast. Right. You see, we were saved by grace through faith. We're not saved by works. We're not saved by failing, mm. feeling. We are saved by the blood of Jesus, mm. by grace exercised yeah. through that faith. I love 1 John 5, mm. verses 11 through 13. This is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. Mm. And this life is in Thanks. his son. Mm. He who has a son has life. Well. He who does not have the Son does not have life. Right. These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. That's what does right. that Amen. say? Amen. That says to me that God wants us to have assurance Amen. of yes. our salvation. Amen. Amen. That's right. Yes. Experience number three, joy in Jesus. Yes. Psalm 51. We're going back to Psalm 51. Right. Let's look at verse 8. Make me, David's praying, make me hear joy and gladness mm. that the bones you have broken may mm. rejoice. Joy and gladness, that word joy in the Hebrew means exultation, mm. great rejoicing. Make me hear joy and gladness. It's interesting to me, David does not ask to be comforted until he's cleansed. Do you notice that? Mm. Yeah, the purging is. with hyssop happens first, then the joy and rejoicing comes after the cleansing. That's good. You know, so many times we want uh, peace in our heart. Mm -hmm. We want freedom. We want deliverance. But we are not willing to take the steps that are necessary to achieve that peace. Mm. We say, God, would you give me peace in my sin? That's not going to work. No. That is not biblical. That is not how God operates. First, we come before him and we pray the prayer that Shelley talked about with, with cleanse me and blot out my sin. Mm -hmm. Purge me with hyssop. Then and only then mm. can the Lord Jesus bring peace to your heart mm -hmm. and then he can bring joy experience the joy of his salvation yeah. and joy in Jesus. Yeah. Experience number four, recreation. Psalm 51 verse 10, mm. first half of the verse, create in me a clean heart. Amen. Amen. Oh God. Yeah. Right. That word create, bara, means to shape, create. And it's used when God is the one mm. doing the creation. Mm -hmm. In this particular form, it is used of God's activity to create something from nothing. Yeah. It's used in Genesis 1 verse 1. In the beginning, God created, God bara. God made something from nothing. There was nothing and God spoke and this world came into existence. There is nothing in my heart but deadness and sin and transgression. <laughs> and God spoke yeah. and created in me again, he bara, a clean mm, heart. That's right. God can create something from nothing yeah. where your heart feels dead and empty and mm. trespasses and sins, That's God right. can create right. newness of yeah. life. Yeah. This Amen. word bara is used only when God is the subject. 
Mm. Only God can bara. Yes, Only right. God creates something from yes. nothing. Only God creates in you and me a clean heart. Amen. The fifth experience is renewing. Mm -hmm. Creating me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right yes. spirit within me. Right. Renew, kadash, to renew, repair, yes. restore. God can restore and repair what was broken yes. and make you new again. Experience number six, experiencing Christ's presence. Mm -hmm. Psalm 51, 11, do not cast me away from your presence. Again, David does not ask for Christ's presence until he is cleansed. Uh -huh. Experience number seven yeah. is victory from the Holy Spirit. Amen. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Why do you and I need the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit brings conviction of sin. The Holy Spirit draws us in repentance. The Holy Spirit teaches us and guides us into all truth. Amen. The Holy Spirit allows Christ to dwell in our hearts through faith. The Holy Spirit gives us victory in the yes. battle between self and the spirit and the flesh. The Holy Spirit gives us power for obedience and sanctifies us. The Holy Spirit intercedes for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. The Holy Spirit bestows spiritual gifts in the life of the believer and the Holy Spirit empowers you and I to be his witnesses. Mm. Praise Amen. the Lord. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. You can't help but like it. You just love That's it, right. right? Love the Word of God. Thursday's yeah. lesson, we'll quickly get on that, Reflections of God's Light. Now, this continues on with the seed that you've already planted in, in the Word of God. Now, what is a reflector? I'm to be a reflector. What does that really mean to be a reflector? Webster tells us to give back an image. That's what it does. Mm -hmm. It's a mirror. It's a uh, re to reproduce, to bring back a person that reflects. I believe that we, God created us to reflect His image, no doubt about it. And back in Matthew 5, 14, He says, Ye are the light of the world. There's no doubt about that. Thursday's lesson probably somewhere or the other has affected all of us probably in some form or fashion. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we don't care to admit it. Yeah. But it's good sometimes just to be open certainly with God. Memories of failure. <laughs> some of you have memories of failure. Maybe some of you say that you don't. But uh, I, they can be painful. They can be embarrassing. Yeah. <laughs> they can be something you wish you didn't have to face up to. You know, uh, the forgiveness part is like, oh, you know, do I have to go through this? Or just simply wishing, I wished I didn't have to go through it. I wished I could just forget about it and everybody else would too. And maybe it'll go away. It's not quite like that. But uh, sometimes we're broken and sometimes we're broken and we come to God and do it in the right way. He puts the pieces back to be better than they ever Amen. were to begin with. I, I don't know how he does it. But he just says that he will, and I, I've claimed that in my own heart and life. Amen. And uh, God's been good. I could start with myself on this Thursday's lesson, but I won't do it. It'll take way too much time. <laughs> and I don't think you'd be pleased with it or you'd want to hear <laughs> those things. So maybe maybe with that thought in mind, every one of us might put ourselves in those shoes, as you brought out very aptly, that really basically there's none good, no, not one. That's right. Amen. It's all about Jesus, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Psalms 51, 13, just look at that. What we're going to do is kind of go over a few of these verses here. Psalms 51, 13 through 18, we see what David uh, wanted to do in his painful experience. Here's what he did, and there's a reason for what he, certainly what he did and how he's explaining it mm -hmm. to us and because he, you know, we're, we're going to go through some of those things. Psalms 51, 13 says, Notice, then will I teach transgressors thy ways. Yeah. And sinners shall be converted unto thee. Those powerful, powerful words. So what does David do as he realizes what's happening, what's taking place? He's making changes. He promises to teach. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's what we should all be doing. We should promise because God has forgiven us, right? And that we should right. promise to try to teach others or maybe let in on maybe the experiences, some of the things that we've went through. And he's going to teach the transgressors God's way. Mm -hmm. I think that's very, very important. David had been a transgressor. There's no doubt about it. Now he wants to use, as we read here, his experience uh, as an example and because uh, he found mercy with God. And certainly when you found mercy with God, when you've been down that road, sometimes it's easier to explain it to other folks. I've been there. That's happened. It's done it. And God's goodness of, uh, to each and every one of us. And uh, he said, simply, if you want to know how, do it the same th th way that I did it. Humble yourself, confess your sin, seek God's face, and God is always willing. I love that, always to take us back into the foe, and true forgiveness is, treats us though we never sin. That's, that's been right. brought out. That's, I mean, that's so wonderful. And then the Bible says that God loves us, right? He loves us as he loves his own son. 
Mm -hmm. I still haven't got my mind all Amen. around that just yet, but I, I, I love it. I love to hear it, and I'm encouraged by that. Mm -hmm. Psalms 51, 14, he simply cries out again, Deliver me mm -hmm. from blood guiltness, O God, thou God of my what? Salvation. Salvation. Mm -hmm. And my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. David felt the guilt of sin. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever fallen deep enough into it, you'll feel the guilt mm -hmm. of sin. It becomes mm -hmm. too heavy and there comes time you say, I, I, I can't continue on this way. I need God to help me. It was, uh, he, he wanted so much to be delivered and to be set free from it. And he prays that, you know, particular sin that once he had been guilty of was certainly what? Blood. Mm -hmm. The shedding of blood, you know, right. uh, we call it, uh, you know, he, he planned it. Mm -hmm. You know, and you think, how much worse can it get? It wasn't accidental. It was planned. <laughs> there was a reason for why he mm -hmm. did it. So he now cries out simply, he says here, cries out to God for mm -hmm. mercy, and he cries out for deliverance. Amen. David simply says, deliver me. That's right. You know, I mean, how often have we said that? Sometimes we don't feel like we need to be delivered, maybe. Maybe that's the problem. I need to say that every day of my life, oh, God, deliver me. Deliver me. Why? Because, you know, sin's all around. We have to be careful. It's, it's surrounding us. It's trying to take us down. David recognized God yeah. as the God of his salvation. So maybe that's a good point for us to remember. He's the only one is a God of our salvation. He says, Lord, thou art the God of my salvation. Therefore, deliver me from the dominion of sin, the handcuffs Amen. of sin. You have to be careful with those things, right? Only God can take those things off, you know, when we get them on. He goes on to say, deliver me. And notice this. I, I found this it was thrilling and yet informative. He said, and the, if you, when you deliver me, my tongue shall sing aloud your righteousness. Yeah. Mm. Now, what had happened? Verse 15, O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. What happened? Sin came in, took over this individual. He no longer could sing praises unto God. Yes. He could no longer open his mouth and praise God the way he used to because sin had taken dominion over him. His mind was different. His thinking was different. And he said, Lord, Lord, help me. And if you help me, I'll abundantly praise you. That's right. You know, abundantly? How could, how could, he, how could he abundantly praise God? He was praising God before sin, as big as his heart was, maybe he needed a bigger heart. Mm. Maybe we need a bigger heart mm. that we might praise God more than what we've done or we, you know, maybe ever done in our life. I think we need to do that. Mm. Remember, the guilt had closed his lips. Mm. No longer, you know. And prayer, he could no longer pray the way that he used to pray. What happened? David realized his transgression was fearful. Oh, my. It was shameful. Mm. And you know what? He was too ashamed to come into the presence of God. Many people fall into sin and they no longer feel a desire to come back to church. They no longer want to talk to the pastor. They don't answer his phone calls and they don't answer the door when you go there. You know, not that they have to stand before a, an individual. Mm -hmm. But here with David, as he felt and he realized his transgression, how fearful it was, he, he, did, he didn't feel the need to go into God's presence. He, he, he wanted to, but yet, no, I, I can't do this. I'm too embarrassed. I'm too ashamed. But he changed his approach, praise God, for that, mm -hmm. you know. And it, it, it's something I think we need to really look at. I want to skip to verse 17 quickly because time's going right on down. It said, the sacrifices are God, notice this, very familiar, or broken what? Spirit. Broken spirit, right? It's broken and a contrite heart, O God. That's right. Thou will not despise. I like that. God looks at the inner man. Amen. Mm -hmm. Not look at the outward like we do right. sometime and whether we like what we see or not and we make judgments or whatever, but that's not what it is. He looks at the inner man. And when he sees that broken heart, he sees that broken spirit mm -hmm. as of repentance, right. you know. It's, it, it's, God looks, I believe, into the heart that's willing to break away from sin. Mm. Right. There's a difference right. in saying that. To break away from, from sin. Yes, Pain's going to be involved. We've had a lot of cards and letters and people we've talked to over and over for months on end that's making a wrong decision and not what God would have them to do. You try to explain the way God says in his word, but it's just, it's just too painful. They say, we, I don't want to, basically. Yeah. You know, we need to really be praying about that. David was willing to break away from that pain. Notice that a heart must be pliable also, too. Mm -hmm. Right? Pain's involved, get life squared away again. Our heart has to be pliable so that we right, cope up with the Word of God. And we have to be 
listen, we have to be very patient when God begins to apply uh, the rod of correction. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's not easy. When the rod of correction is being applied, we don't like it, but yet I know it's for our own good. I praise God for that. Remember, to me, the, the broken heart is only acceptable uh, to God. It's only acceptable through Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. His Son. Maybe we should really think about it, maybe in our own life and what we're striving for right now. As a human being, I don't know about you, but I get tired of things always being broke mm -hmm. and you have to fix them. That's usually when they call me. Something's broke. We need you to fix it. Well, I get tired of it. I'm glad. My point is I'm glad that God doesn't get tired of it. That's right. I come to him broken every day. Amen. And he says, Kenny, I'm going to fix you. Amen. He says to you, Jim, Sally, Pete, whatever it might be, I'm going to fix you. Amen. Don't get tired of coming to, tired of coming to me. I know you're broken. I know you hurt. I know you need help. Mm -hmm. And I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. You know, God says to you, I love you with an everlasting mm -hmm. love. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Some of the verses we learn is just as a child and I still claim those today. And uh, I think today that God looks beyond a broken heart and a contrite heart and says, you know what, these are the people that I'm looking for. The ones that will come and help you know, prepare this work so that Jesus can come and go home with us. Mm, praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you so much, brother, for that. Let's get right into our final thoughts. Mm -hmm. Yes, how amazing that the son of David, Solomon, wrote mm -hmm. a text about forgiveness. Mm -hmm. He made it clear in Proverbs 28, 13, which I believe he learned from his father's experience. It was something that was not totally uh, misunderstood by the family, mm -hmm. but it was clearly delineated the foundation of forgiveness. The Bible says, he who covers mm -hmm. his yeah. sin Mercy. will not prosper. But whoever confesses and forsakes them yeah. will have mercy. That's the first thing David asked for. Yes. Amen. 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 And I just want to once again encourage you, if you're feeling distanced from the Lord, if you're feeling guilty or condemned or just you feel ashamed, go get your Bible, pray Psalm 51 mm -hmm. to the Lord, and then here's what God says to you. Isaiah 43, 25, God's response to you will be, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions mm. for my own <laughs> sake, and I will not remember your sin. Yes. Amen. I love God. I'm just so grateful. Give him a chance. Open up your heart to him. Amen. David fell. David got back up by the grace of God, and he was a better man for it afterward. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord each and every day. Yes. I pray to the Lord, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit mm. within me. We all need the Holy Spirit, yes. and the Holy Spirit has been leading and guiding these studies. We know that, that you are learning a lot. We're learning a lot. We want to invite you right back here mm -hmm. next week on 3ABN Sabbath School panel mm -hmm. for lesson number five entitled, Come to Me. So mm. get your family together. Get your friends together. We'll see you right back here next week. Welcome to Hope Sabbath School, an in-depth, interactive study of the Word of God. I'm excited about this series, Rest in Christ. Today, the cost of rest. It's not a cost you have to pay. It's a cost that's been paid for you so you can experience rest in Christ. And I'm excited today because one of our team is going to be leading our study. Brittany, we're glad that you're going to be leading, I think, a powerful study of the Word of God today. I'm also excited... In addition to our team, take a look. It's our Gideon's Band, just five in the studio. Great to have you all here today. But also, we have got two of our team joining us remotely. Shana, joining us from Maine. Shana, great to have you here with us. And Puya, joining us from Hawaii. Puya, great to have you with us today as we're studying together. And we're praying that God would guide our study as we open his word. The goal is not just to know about a mistake an ancient king made, mm -hmm. but how to find rest in Christ. Amen? Amen? Here's a few notes from some of our Hope Sabbath School family. Uh, Puring writes from California in the United States. That's a name I've not heard before, Puring. We thank God for Hope Sabbath School, 
Purring writes, we're always blessed whenever we watch your program, Learning Much. It's our prayer that God will continue to use you in spreading God's truth in all corners of the world. Amen? Amen. We wish you the richest blessings of heaven. Well, Purring, thanks for writing to us from California. Here's a note from Frederick in Kenya. Frederick writes and says, I'm always blessed by your interactive Bible studies. For sure, you people open many people's eyes by comparing Scripture with Scripture. At first, I used to read the Bible just as a storybook without any understanding. But thanks be to God Almighty, I now understand the Bible. Amen. That's one of the goals of Hope Sabbath School. Thank you for writing to us, Frederick. Here is a note from a donor in Arizona, in the United States. And I want to thank, you know we don't mention donors' names, but I want to thank each one of you for supporting this, this ministry. You can go to hopetv.org slash donate, or you can go to our website and just click on the donate button. Well, here's a, a couple from Arizona write and say, Hello, Hope Sabbath School members. Hello. Hello. Even got away from Hawaii there. We're writing to you from beautiful Arizona as faithful watchers of Hope Sabbath School. We feel so connected to all of the team members and the team teachers. We thank you for helping us grow in the Lord as we absorb each weekly study. Soon we will be moving to beautiful Western Australia and look forward to reuniting with Hope Sabbath School there. Well, we want to just say to you, we have many Hope Sabbath School members in Australia. Thank God for the global outreach of Hope Channel. We hope our small donation can make a difference, and a donation of $317. Well, I want to thank you. That may have some significance. I don't know. But it certainly will bless the ministry of Hope Channel and thanks to each one of you who partners with us. Oh, Nicole, we have a note from Jamaica. Yes, give a wave to Elaine. Would you do that? All right. Elaine Wright says, I'm emailing you from Jamaica. I'm so delighted to be part of Hope Sabbath School. I'm happy to let you know that Hope Sabbath School has been a part of my life. Every week I watch Hope Sabbath School and it helps me to understand the Bible better. I also practice the songs and sing along and it gives me joy to learn the Word of God so quickly. I love the interactions with team members. May God bless Hope Sabbath School always. Well, Elaine, thanks for writing to us from Jamaica. And one last note from Julia says, I'm writing from the beautiful island of Barbados. Mm. I watch Hope Sabbath School at 11 o'clock as part of my Sabbath worship. Oh, wow. That's beautiful, mm. isn't it? Yeah. I really enjoy your delivery of God's Word and the fellowship between you as brothers and sisters in Christ. Well, we're a family together. I pray God will continue to add understanding. You'll keep up the good work in helping to build the kingdom of God. May God continue to bless each one of you and your ministry. Well, Julia, from the beautiful island of Barbados, thanks for writing to us. Pray that you would be blessed. But right now, Brittany, let's uh, pray as we begin our study. Sure. Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you so much because you are our Father. Amen. And we thank you that you have brought us together to study your word once again. Lord, we thank you for our Hope Sabbath School family around the world that is joining us in this series on resting in Christ. And we just pray that as we study about a restless king today, that we would find the same hope that he found in you, hmm. and that we would put our hearts and our lives in your hands so that we can truly rest in you. And we just pray that your Holy Spirit would come into each one of our hearts and lives and touch us as we study your word together that you would illuminate our minds to understand and that you would transform our hearts in the process. And we thank you and praise you. In your name we pray, dear Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, it's so good to be here with each one of you today. 
And today we're studying about a king that to some of you may be very well known and um, a story that you maybe even grew up with. Mm -hmm. But to some of you, this may be a first time hearing about King David and what happened to him and his restlessness. But what we're going to find today is that even though King David fell, he found hope in his Savior. And we can find that same hope today. And so we're going to begin our study in 2 Samuel. Let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 11. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to ask Sabina if she would start us off with 2 Samuel chapter 11. And we're going to look at verses 1 and 2a to get started together today. Okay, so I'll be reading from the New King James Version. And it says, It happened in the spring of the year, at the time when kings go out to, to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him, and all Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Haba. But David remained at Jerusalem. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. Let's just stop there for a minute and let's talk about what was happening um, at the beginning of this story. We have King David and um, why was he at home and why does he appear restless at the beginning of this story? Mm. It was at the wrong place at the wrong time. Mm. He was supposed to be somewhere and he wasn't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely, yes. You know, it kind of reminds me today, it's like, well, I was just surfing the internet. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Just oh. seeing what I might find. Mm-hmm. There, there is, he's got um, time on his hands, yeah. mm-hmm. idle time, mm-hmm. and, and he's, he's actually heading for trouble. Yes, mm-hmm. definitely. Yeah. Yes, Puya, please share with us. Yes, I, I find it interesting that what, in verse 1 that we just read, it stated that at the time when kings go out to battle, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It was specifically mentioned that kings are out in battle, but King David apparently was not with his soldiers at this time, which I believe is the beginning of the the tragic story that we'll be continuing to see that he was not supporting his soldiers in the battlefield. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Thank you for pointing Mm -hmm. that out for us, Puya, that he had a place where he was supposed to be, Mm -hmm. but he was not there. And the Bible actually says, but he was at home. Mm -hmm. Um, Jason, you had a comment to add to that. Yeah, so building on this, David is the warrior king. That's what he's known for, and that's what God has called him to do. And mm-hmm. so I think the better thing, a way to avoid restlessness is to be where God calls us oh, to be. Good Ooh. point. Mm-hmm. Very yeah. wonderful point. Thank you yeah. for sharing that. Mm-hmm. Now, we know that David wasn't where he was supposed to be. Mm-hmm. Now, we want to find out what happened next. He's restless. He's out on his roof. Mm-hmm. And some of us know what happens next, but let's read it together. Mm-hmm. And Nicole, would you read uh, the next part? We're going to re- look at Second Samuel chapter 11, verse 2b through verse 4. And the New International Version says, From the roof he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. And David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, She is Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. Now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanliness. Then she went back home. Thank you for reading that for us, Nicole. Mm. Now, what temptation did David face as he was up on that roof walking along? Anyone want to comment on what temptation that he was facing at that time? Mm. Jason. Well, there's clearly the temptation. uh, He's seeing something he shouldn't be seeing, which is another man's wife undressed. And so uh, the temptation is to... I guess, well, we see what eventually leads to is to explore this little further, uh, find out more what he can, kind of um, to, 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 to allow his mind to wander and his eyes to go in that direction instead of just, you know, turning around or going back inside. Yes, mm-hmm. definitely. So we see lust is the first thing that happens. Gladys, did you have something to he add to that? He also abused his position. He was the king. So uh, he, that he knew that she, but Shiva could not refuse him because she, he was the king. So he abused his p- uh, position, you know, and, and ordaining her to come to him. Definitely. Mm-hmm. Yes, Pastor Derek. I think Job said, I made a covenant with my eyes. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the first problem is not the adultery. The first problem mm-hmm. is as soon as he saw that there was someone bathing, 
he should have immediately, but he says, she was very beautiful. <laughs> it's like he's already started focusing. Mm -hmm. yep. and, mm -hmm. and, and tragically, there's that sequence of lingering, mm -hmm. gay, staring, mm -hmm. calling, yeah. and, mm -hmm. and, and eventually, you know, committing adultery. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. We see that progression. And um, I'm actually going to have us read a verse in a minute that shows us kind of mm -hmm. the root of sin and, and how it starts in our lives and where it leads us. Mm -hmm. But before we go there, um, just thinking about David and how he was in the wrong place at the wrong time and then how he acted upon that. Um, what should he have been doing when he was restless? Maybe he couldn't sleep and he was up on that roof. Um, what should he have been doing instead of looking at some beautiful woman that wasn't his? Mm. Yes, um, Pedro and then Jason. I think uh, David is the one that wrote the Psalms. He should have been writing and talking <laughs> to God. Right? You know, I go to read the Psalms when I need to be, find comfort and to find focus. I think he should have been writing it more. Definitely, <laughs> writing the Psalms. Yes, Jason. And if he couldn't be there in battle, he could at least be praying for the soul mm -hmm. could That's be thinking, thinking and, yeah. and doing his kingly duties yeah. uh, as well interceding if you will for the people mm -hmm. definitely mm -hmm. he should have been interceding yeah. he, that it was part of his position as a king um, is mm -hmm. a religious leader as well God called him because mm -hmm. of his heart for him and yeah. he could have mm -hmm. been praying that God is intervening in that battle rather than letting Satan win the battle in his own heart at yeah. that time. You Pastor know, we Dan. left uh, Brittany a, a little bit with Pedro. He should have been writing scripture songs, <laughs> but, but actually he'd written a beautiful song in Psalm 16, which it says, when I've, I've set the Lord always before me, when he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Yeah. If instead of gazing at this naked woman, he had set the Lord before him, he yeah. would not have been shaken. So mm -hmm. he did have those songs mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. he really could have been singing, and, and, and we can too when we face those uh, yeah. temptations. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Cool. And that's a great reminder for us because all of us are tempted at one point or another. Mm -hmm. All of us mm -hmm. find ourselves in situations like yeah. David where yeah. we weren't planning to yep. be there, but we are there at the mm -hmm. wrong moment and we have to make a decision. How am I going to respond in that moment? Sure. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Before we move on, I wanted us to read a verse found in James that just talks about the progression of sin and, and how it starts in our lives. So let's turn to the book of James and we're going to look at chapter 1. James chapter 1. And Shana, can I ask you to read James chapter 1 and we're going to look at verses 14 and 15. James chapter 1 verses 14 and 15. And I'll be reading from the King James Version. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. But when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Mm. Wow. Thank you, Shana, for reading that verse for us. So just looking at the verse that Shana read in James, as well as the story that we've just read so far about King David, what can we learn, what lessons can we apply to our lives today? Mm. Yes, Gladys. You know, one of the things that I used to tell my students was, you, can, you cannot prevent birds from flying over your head, but you can mm -hmm. definitely stop them from building a nest. Mm -hmm. So that's exactly temptation. So we cannot avoid temptation. So they are all around us, mm -hmm. but we cannot give it space to be in our hearts and to give fruit. Definitely. Actually, there's a little more to that line. You can prevent them from building a nest in your hair. <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, they head. could build a nest somewhere else. Yes, in your head. But you're not going to let them land mm -hmm. uh, there. Yeah. And that's no. so important. To yeah. me, mm -hmm. Brittany, it's just, I mean, he was a man of God. He wrote the scripture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But no one is immune from temptation. Mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. And yes. if we're careless about the small things, mm -hmm. we might be shocked to mm -hmm. see what we would end up doing. Mm, definitely. Mm. I was actually reading about the kings in that day, and they had this idea that the king could get away with things in, in their, the cultures that were surrounding Israel. The kings could do whatever they pleased, and the people didn't question it because they were king, and they were looked at as almost like God. So David was surrounded by these influences mm -hmm. and he fell into the same trap instead of saying no I'm a different kind of king mm -hmm. I'm a king after God's own heart mm -hmm. um, he fell into the practices that were happening around him Nicole I saw that you had did you have a comment that you wanted well, to share it's just that you know my Bible said dragged into something you know mm -hmm. we have to 
choose to not do it, mm -hmm. just like we choose to do it. I think it's very important for us to realize that the choice is ours to make, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the choice is ours to let our minds wander when, they, when we are distracted. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, Sabina? I'm also thinking about a saying that in Portuguese people say, you know, that an empty mind is the office of the devil. Mm. So mm -hmm. I think that this, this story also makes us think that, you know, usually if you're busy doing the work of God or doing what God has called you to, even though you may face temptations and difficulties, uh, you have other things to, to occupy yourself with that are the things that God called you actually to do. And this may be helpful mm -hmm. also to overcome temptation. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you for that reminder, Sabina. Mm -hmm. Now, the next part I want to look at is other Bible stories. We have the story of King David, but what other Bible characters come to mind um, who allowed their restlessness to lead them into a path of sin? Mm -hmm. Anyone have a Bible character that pops into your mind? Yes, Gladys? Abraham and Sarai. Mm -hmm. You know, God gave them a promise, and it was taking longer than what they thought it should mm -hmm. take. And that took them to make different decisions that was not under God's plan. Yeah, so mm -hmm. Abraham took his wife's servant mm -hmm. and had a child with her rather than the child of promise that God had, had given that Sarah would have. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Thank you for that example. Um, Sabina, you had an example yeah, as well? Yeah, I was thinking about the Israelites right before when they were still waiting for Moses to come down. Uh, from Sinai, and mm -hmm. they couldn't wait, you know, for their leader to come back, and they were already worshiping, you know, the calf. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I can think of them as being the great example of lack of restlessness when God was trying just to come and seal the covenant He had with them, and just all those promises that they had He had for them, and they were already sinning. Mm -hmm. uh, was they were making their own God rather exactly. than the God who had led them out of slavery. Who yes. was at work for them, you know? Yeah. Yes. Puya, <laughs> feel free to share with us. Yes. Uh, picking up on what uh, Sabina just said, I also was reminded of the Israelites just before they entered Canaan. Mm -hmm. um, they were led away into sexual sins uh, in, with the neighboring uh, tribes uh, before they entered Canaan. And as a result, a lot of people lost their lives. And so... It's, uh, it's almost like a parallel uh, that just before the Israelites entered uh, Canaan, uh, they faced this uh, temptation of sexual sin, just like King David. And um, we are now once again on the border of heavenly Canaan. And it seems that Satan is using the same tool to attack, uh, uh, to tempt people today. Everywhere we go, we see billboards and uh, we see temptation everywhere on social media, on the internet. Even if you try to avoid it, it seems like there are landmines everywhere on the internet that if you're not mm -hmm. careful, you could be led from one step into the next. And so uh, it, I believe that the Israelites were a good example and that we also need to uh, learn the lesson from the Israelites that as we are now close to entering heavenly Canaan, we must be on guard too. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Thank you for sharing that. Now, before we continue on with this story, um, I want us to continue what we know that King David um, continued to inquire about Bathsheba. He took her. He committed sexual sin like we've been talking about. Um, but what did he do after that? He, he didn't just stop there with adultery, um, but it led him down this path that we read in James leads to death, leads mm -hmm. to destruction. And so yeah. we want to read the rest of the story. Mm -hmm. Let's continue on in 2 Samuel chapter 11 and we're going to read verses 5 through 24 and Shana do you have 2nd Samuel chapter 11 verses 5 through 24? I do and I'll be reading from the King James Version and the woman conceived and sent and told David and said I am with child and David sent to Joab saying send me Uriah the Hittite and Joab sent Uriah to David and when Uriah was come unto him, David demanded of him how Joab did, and how the people did, and how the war prospered. And David said to Uriah, Go down to thy house and wash thy feet. And Uriah departed out of the king's house, and there followed him a mess of meat from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord, and went not down to his house. And when they had told David, saying, Uriah went not down unto his house, David said unto Uriah, Camest thou not from thy journey? 
Why then didst thou not go unto thine house? And Uriah said unto David, The ark and Israel and Judah abide in tents, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go into mine house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As thou livest and as thy soul liveth, I will not do this thing. Oh. And David said to Uriah, Tarry here today also, and tomorrow I will let thee depart. So Uriah abode in Jerusalem that day and the morrow. And when David had called him, he did eat and drink before him. And he made him drunk, and at even he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his lord but went not down to his house. And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retire ye from him that he may be smitten and die. And it came to pass when Joab observed the city that he assigned Uriah unto a place where he knew that valiant men were. Mm. And the men of the city went out and fought with Joab, and there fell some of the people of the servants of David, and Uriah the Hittite died also. Then Joab sent and told David all the things concerning the war, and charged the messenger, saying, When thou hast made an end of telling the matters of the war unto the king, and if so be that the king's wrath arise, and he say unto thee, Wherefore approach ye so nigh unto the city when ye did fight? Know ye not that they would shoot from the wall? Who smote Abimelech the son of Jerubasheth? Did not a woman cast a piece of millstone upon him from the wall that he died in Thebes? Why went ye nigh unto the wall? Then say thou, Thy servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. So the messenger went and came and shewed David all that Joab had sent him for. And the messenger said unto David, Surely the men prevailed against us and came out unto us into the field, and we were upon them even unto the entering of the gate. And the shooters shot from off the wall upon thy servants, and some of the king's servants be dead, and thy servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. Thank you for reading that long passage for us, Shana. What a devastating story, how one king's decision to not look the other way when he saw something he shouldn't have seen led him to adultery, and then led him to getting another one of his captains of the army involved in lying um, and murder mm -hmm. and, and trying to cover it up just to try to save his face because he caused someone who wasn't his wife to get pregnant. Um, mm -hmm. What a heartbreaking story. Mm -hmm. But the good news is that this is not the end of the story mm -hmm. and that God can even take these ashes that David has brought upon himself and a, a, brought upon his kingdom and he can turn it into something that brings glory to God in the end. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, Nicole. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about something that was said earlier about letting little things in and it becomes bigger. The more that we open ourselves up to even the smallest um, hint of sin, we, let our, we leave ourselves open to committing all kind of atrocities. And that's what happened with David. The this, yeah. this slight glance he had too long led to mm -hmm. death. Yes, mm. Pastor David. I, I, I had a reaction I've never had before. I've heard this story before, but I actually felt tears forming in my eyes mm -hmm. as I'm hearing this story, and I'm thinking, David, I mean, David, he, he, re he relived this story over and over again. Mm -hmm. And I imagine as he, it's right here in the Bible, mm -hmm. that he must have said, oh, God, what was I thinking? Yeah. What was mm -hmm. I thinking that mm -hmm. I would... Not just Uriah, but other good good people died because mm -hmm. of this yeah. plan to kill one man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I, no wonder he's thankful for the grace of God. But the warning I hear mm -hmm. in this story is don't minimize any sin. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because mm -hmm. you may look back and go, mm -hmm. oh, Lord, how did we get here? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Really tragic story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Pastor Derek. But the good news is that God did not allow 
David to stay in this place of hopelessness. Amen. Mm -hmm. He actually sent a prophet to him Amen. with a message mm. and in a way that David would accept. Mm -hmm. uh, many times when we've committed sin, we don't want to have someone pointed out to us, right? <laughs> David tried to hide it. We can yeah. see all the measures he took to try to hide his sin. Mm -hmm. But God sent a prophet in such a loving way to mm -hmm. open up his eyes and his heart to a transformation. And mm -hmm. so let's read that together next. And Puya, would you be willing to read Second Samuel chapter 12? And we're going to look at verses 1 through 9. Second Samuel 12, 1 through 9. Sure, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said to him, There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It ate of his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. And a traveler came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man, and he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die, and he shall restore fourfold for the lamb, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house, and your master's wives into your keeping and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I also would have given you much more. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his side? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm. Wow, what a message. Now, what was God's purpose in sending this message to David in such a way? What was he trying to accomplish? Was he trying to bring condemnation to David um, and saying, this is it, you're done, you're no longer king? What was God trying to do here? Yeah. Yes, Pedro. Well, I look into this story and I see God trying to help him realize of his mistakes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes telling someone that they are wrong might be, uh, make them ashamed and fight against any accusation. Mm -hmm. So I see here in the story, Nathan comes and starts telling the story. Mm -hmm. And he didn't even finish. David already giving a command and says, we need to do this to this man. Mm -hmm. So he already compelled to act upon it. And mm -hmm. that's when Nathan sees that he's convict uh, uh, for the righteousness of God. He has mm -hmm. God on his heart, mm -hmm. but he had committed a crime. And he so says, you need to act mm -hmm. upon it. Yes, thank you, Pedro. So he's using this story to arouse his sympathy and sense of justice mm. for right and wrong. Gladys, you had something to add to that. I was just going to add what Pedro said, that he wanted him to see for his own eyes what would be just if that was a just act on his part, yeah. not only for, for Uriah, but also for, for the wife. He wanted, mm. he wanted him to realize for himself Mm. seeing through somebody else, somebody else's eyes. Yeah. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Nicole, did you have something you also wanted to add to well, that? Just the thread of Christ is that he wants to reconcile. Mm -hmm. He wants to come back. He wants us to come back and, and reconcile with him. And so even through the thread of this rebuke, I still hear Christ saying, I'm still trying to pursue you. I still want to be with you. Mm -hmm. And it just for me, it just gives me such hope that God, even in the midst of our um, mm -hmm. sinfulness still wants to reconcile with us. Mm -hmm. Definitely. That reminds me of a verse that I'd like us to read right now in Second Peter. Let's go to Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 that just shows us the heart of God and how he doesn't want to condemn, he wants to save. So, Sabina, would you read Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 for us? Yes. Second Peter 3, 9? Yes. Okay, so I'll be reading from the New King James Version, and it says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, 
but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sabina. That just shows us the heart of God, that whenever he sent a message through his prophets, while the message might have seemed like a harsh rebuke, his whole purpose was to help open our eyes to see our need, that we are dying, that we are, are leaving ourselves into destruction, and God wants to save us. Mm -hmm. So thank you for reading that for us. Uh, we're going to continue on with David. How did he respond? We know that his anger was aroused when he heard this story about someone else, mm -hmm. but now he realizes it's really a story about himself. Mm -hmm. And we want to see how he responds after Na um, Nathan says, you are the man. Mm -hmm. So Jason, I'm going to ask you to continue the story story in 2 Samuel chapter 12, and we're going to look at verse 13a to get started, and then we'll also turn to a psalm that David wrote after that. So 2 Samuel 13, uh, 12, verse 13a. Got the New King James Version here. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13, the first part says, So David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Mm -hmm. Thank you for reading that. So he confesses, right? He realizes, you're right, this is me, and this is what I have done. And we know that David wrote one of his most famous psalms, um, Psalm 51, after this experience. And we don't, don't have time to read the whole thing, but I encourage you, read it. Open up your Bible at home and read the whole psalm for yourself and see this whole confession of David and as, as he's realized what he's done against God and against others. So let's go to Psalm 51. And Jason, I'm going to have you continue reading in Psalm 51, verses 1 through 4 for us. All right. The New King James Version, Psalm 51, verses 1 through 4. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Mm -hmm. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Mm. Thank you for reading that. Mm. So we see David's heart and how he truly confessed. And I find it interesting that he said, against you, you only have I sinned. Now, was David minimizing that he had sinned against Uriah or against Bathsheba? What was he meaning by that? Against you and you only have I sinned, Lord. Mm. Yes, Jason. <clears throat> well, some people could say, oh, I just sinned against the people. You know, I did a human sin, but, you know, it has nothing to do with God. It's just only these people, so it's not such a big deal. It's a few people, no big deal. Mm. But the truth is, whenever we hurt one of God's children, mm. we're hurting him. We're he hurting God mm -hmm. himself. And not only that, but we're hurting the reputation of God. If we call ourselves a follower of him, um, and now we are doing something that's completely against his character, then everyone else sees, mm -hmm. oh, that's the God you serve? And it makes God look like he's the evil one. Yes, yeah. Nicole? True repentance happens when we realize that our sin is against God, not against the person that we actually wronged. Mm -hmm. Once we realize that we sinned against God, we'll then want to ask for forgiveness from the person, but really the repentance comes when we realize we have sinned against God, not just the person that we have offended. Definitely. Thank you for sharing that, Nicole. And, and I know we don't have time to read the whole scripture song, but genuine repentance isn't just sorrow for a bad outcome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I love later where he says, create in me a clean heart of mm -hmm. God in mm -hmm. verse 10. Beautiful. So it, it's really is, is really kind of throwing himself on the mercy and grace of God, mm -hmm. which is, you said at the beginning, is what we all need to do. Definitely. Um, but that's genuine repentance. It? Give me a, a clean heart and a right spirit. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you all for sharing. Yes. Now, I want to ask the team, does anyone have a time where God spoke to you, either through his word, through another person, where you were mm -hmm. confronted um, with a sin that maybe you didn't even realize or that you had been trying to cover up and and later you're so thankful that God sent that person or sent that scripture to to speak to you. Does anyone have uh, a testimony to share of an experience like that? When I read scripture, yeah. Yeah. the Holy Spirit, yeah. I always say the Holy Spirit will be much more direct with you than you should ever be to anyone else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's mm -hmm. why I think it's good for us to read the Bible mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. 
The Bible is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path mm -hmm. and doesn't Paul say to Timothy it's given for reproof, for correction mm -hmm. and instruction, and instruction in righteousness. So yeah. I, I would say many times when we read the Bible, mm -hmm. the Spirit will slow us down and say, I'm talking to you right here. <laughs> yes. Whether it's a haughty mm -hmm. spirit or a lying lips yeah. or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but he seems to always do it in such a merciful yeah. and loving way. Yes, mm -hmm. definitely. Yeah. Uh, we have some more hands. Uh, Pedro and then Gladys. By talking about a story, it reminds me of uh, when I was young. I was probably in my early teens. And um, I, f I found my friend on the street, and he was riding his cart with his son. Mm. And I asked him to ride his little cart, you know, a little a small cart that you drive on the road, motorized. And he went inside to, to see his friend and talk to him. And I, I, well, as I was coming into the driveway, uh, my, my foot slipped out of the brake, and I hit the gate. Mm. I was frightened at that moment. I look at the gate, there was nothing there. I look at the frame, there was nothing there. I said goodbye to my, to, <laughs> to my friend and I left home. Mm -hmm. I was ashamed of myself. Mm -hmm. Later on that day, my friend showed up. And I'm so thankful that he came because he came with a, with a humble heart and says, anything happen this evening that you need to share with me? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I told him, sweet. yes, <laughs> I did. And I was ashamed. And I'm so thankful that he came to me because yeah. I could have been a, a guilty for the rest of my life because <laughs> I, I was hiding that shame mm -hmm. uh, of, of making the nest. It was something simple. He just saying, I understand that happens. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it kind of moved the gate uh, uh, out of the rail. We put it back in, and okay. there was damage on the frame. But mm -hmm. I, we, we, you're, you're our friend. Your family is our part of our family. I just mm -hmm. want you to not react this way anymore. Mm -hmm. And I was mm -hmm. so thankful to that. Wow. that what a wonderful example he gave to you because I know for myself, when I've done something against someone else, then I don't want to talk to them. Mm -hmm. I feel bad and it severs that relationship. So he was mm -hmm. coming to you, caring about the relationship and showing you how to confess and how to mend that relationship. Yes, Gladys. Well, I'm a little bit ashamed of sharing this, but I think it's important. Um, you know, when somebody does something to you and you feel like you're right, Mm -hmm. You tend mm -hmm. to defend yourself mm -hmm. and you share with this person and then you share with the other person because you feel like you are right to do so, mm -hmm. you know. And then I was doing that and I noticed that the story was changing <laughs> mm -hmm. as I share with different person. And I felt like maybe they did it because of this. And I started in infringing into the person's mm -hmm. in intention in saying or doing what they did to me. And I remember during that devotional that night that I was having at home, this verse just kept speaking to my heart. Too much talk leads to sin, mm. but he who mm. holds his tongue yeah. is wise. Mm -hmm. and, and I was just like, why is this? You know, <laughs> just, just touching my heart in a different way. And it just in my sleep, even I will hear the verse. And then I said, that's what it is. The Lord wants me to be quiet. Just shut your <laughs> mouth and mm -hmm. stop repeating something that you don't even know. You're just putting on the other person something that probably was not even in their heart. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, the Lord, not sometimes, mm -hmm. always the Lord through his word, like Pastor Derek said, mm -hmm. speaks to our, to our conscience and something that we're doing wrong that sometimes we just may not notice yeah. otherwise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. I'd love for us all to have more opportunity to share, but we do need to mm -hmm. see what happened with David. Mm -hmm. um, he confessed his mm -hmm. sin. He mm -hmm. realized that what he had done hurt God um, even more than it hurt the people that he had sinned against. Mm -hmm. And let's go back to Second Samuel, and we're looking at chapter 12 and verse 13. And um, let's see the grace that God extends to him even after committing adultery and murder and trying to hide his guilt. And Sabina, would you read Second Samuel 12 and verse 13 for us? Sure. So I'll be reading from the New King James Version, and it says, So David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. Mm. Wow. What uh, an yeah. amazing word from God. I, David is probably thinking about the self-condemnation he gave when he heard that um, message from Nathan. He was giving him this prophecy about, or this parable rather, about um, what happened. And he said, that person should die and he should repay fourfold. And um, now, now God is saying to him, you won't die. 
I've forgiven you. Mm -hmm. And what mm -hmm. mercy, what grace. <laughs> I don't know how David must have felt in that moment. Yeah. It must have been a wave wow. of relief, but also probably mm -hmm. a wave of sadness, mm -hmm. recognizing what he had done against God and what he had done against yeah. his family mm -hmm. and against his kingdom. Mm -hmm. And he, from then on, we mm -hmm. read in Psalms 51 about how it changed his life, mm -hmm. how that forgiveness that he received, he didn't continue going in that way of sin. Right. Um, he actually turned yes. towards God, yeah. and because of the forgiveness he received, he wanted to extend that to others. And mm -hmm. so let's look at a few um, parts of Psalm 51 just to see how God changed his heart and how God can change ours as well. So let's look at Psalm 51. And we're going to look at a few of the highlights of this passage. It's such a beautiful passage. Mm -hmm. And let's look at verse 6 through 12. Psalm 51, 6 through 12. And I'm going to ask Puya to read that for us. Psalm 51, 6 through 12. And I will be reading from the New King James Version. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me by your generous spirit. Amen. And I'll also ask you to read verse 13 as well, Puya. Mm -hmm. Sure. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. Mm. So here wow. we see this beautiful song that David wrote about how God, he's asking God to create in him a clean heart, renew a right spirit. Mm -hmm. He wants to rest in Christ, which is yes. the whole theme of our, yeah. our series, right? Mm -hmm. he's, he's realizing how he's gone away from God yeah. and how he wants to return to him and he mm -hmm. wants God to return to him. Mm -hmm. And then he says, I don't want to just have this salvation restored to me, but I want to teach others yeah. that have fallen into this yeah. trap of sin. Mm -hmm. I want them to yeah. find what I have found. I want them to be converted to you. Mm -hmm. And that's what God does in each one of our lives, right? When yes. we realize what he's done for us and what he has removed mm -hmm. from our lives, then we can't keep it to ourselves. Mm -hmm. We have to go and tell others mm -hmm. yeah. that they too can mm -hmm. receive the same forgiveness and grace mm -hmm. that we have received. Mm -hmm. So true. What a beautiful mm -hmm. transformation that we see in the life of King David. Now, many times when, I don't know about you, but when I have asked God for forgiveness or when I've asked a friend for forgiveness, Satan still brings up that sin that I've done and tries to condemn me and, and put doubts in my heart that, um, you know, you ask for forgiveness, but you don't feel forgiven. So are you really forgiven? Um, or, you know, you said you were sorry to that person, but they're never going to treat you the same way again. Those are doubts that, you know, Satan puts into our hearts and into our minds. So what would you say to somebody who's saying, I ask for forgiveness, um, but I don't feel forgiven. What could you say to a friend who's feeling that way? Yes, Puya. Well, I believe I myself was in this uh, position for a long time where I never felt, I never could felt that I was forgiven and I had self uh, condemnation and doubt on the forgiveness of God. And as a result, the, I, I was not experiencing the joy of salvation. And now one thing I've learned is as God has uh, led me through the word of God, has opened my eyes that I am not to depend on my sinlessness, but on the righteousness of Jesus Christ, which gives me the power to overcome sin in return. And so it, God is calling us to have, to have faith over feelings. Mm -hmm. We should not trust our feelings because feelings can deceive us, but we can have faith in the word of God that tells us that once we confess our sins, God is righteous and just to forgive us of our sins. And we need to believe that. Mm -hmm. And when we believe that there is power through the, the Holy Spirit who gives us the, 
the joy of salvation, to experience that uh, forgiveness. Mm -hmm. But until we come to that point of believing and accepting it, we will continue to doubt. And of course, Satan wants us to continue to doubt God's forgiveness in our lives, but we need to trust God's word over Amen. our own feelings. Amen. That's, That's right. Awesome. Thank you so much for that powerful testimony, Puya, that it's about trusting in the promise of God, not in our feelings. Yeah. And as we put our trust in the promises of God, the feelings will come to match that over time. Yeah. It, it, we don't always feel it right away, but over time, mm -hmm. God will have th those feelings well up inside of us as we believe and trust. Mm -hmm. It's faith over feelings. Thank yeah. you for sharing that. Yeah. Now, we know that uh, many people would say, well, David did such a terrible thing. Um, he hurt so many people. Did God just forgive him and that's it? He didn't have any consequences for his actions? And we do know that David did have consequences, and these consequences were difficult. Mm -hmm. um, just because we are forgiven doesn't mean that there's no um, effect mm -hmm. of our sin. Mm -hmm. And so let's look at a couple verses as we are getting ready to wrap up together. Let's go back to 2 Samuel and chapter 12. 2 Samuel chapter 12. And we're going to look at verses 10 through 12 and also verse 14. And I'm going to ask Nicole to read that for us. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 10 through 12 and 14. Okay, the New International Version of verses 10 through 12 says, Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house, because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Out of your own household, I am going to bring calamity on you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to one who is close to you, and he will sleep with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. And then verse, verse 14 says, But because by doing this you have shown utter contempt for the Lord, the son born to you will die. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. And we know the rest of the story that David actually fasts and prays that this son would not die. Mm -hmm. And then when the son does die, he recognizes it's time to move on. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting when you read the rest of the story of King David, the very uh, judgment that he brought uh, upon that parable, that person in the, the story that Nathan brought to him, came upon him. Yeah. He said, may this person repay four times times what he has done and he lost four of his sons in tragic ways mm -hmm. and so wow. he did suffer um, consequences for his sin but God did spare his own life mm -hmm. um, and he didn't just leave him there he allowed him to live so that he could share God does transform and he can take something difficult and turn it into something good yeah. and and one of the things that as I was studying this lesson I realized is that we don't often focus on Bathsheba and what she went through. She lost her husband. Mm -hmm. She lost a baby. Um, she was taken advantage of. She went through so much. Mm -hmm. um, but there is some good news to the end of, of the story. And does anyone know um, the good news about Bathsheba and what happened and how God gave her grace and gave her um, some kind of hope in the midst of all this turmoil that she went through? Does anyone think of something um, that's redeeming out of what David did and what Satan turned for evil, God turned into something good. Yes, Apuya. Yes, um, uh, ev even though Bathsheba went through all these terrible uh, circumstances, um, we find her being described uh, in, in one of the, the, the names of the ancestors of Jesus, the Messiah, when we read Matthew chapter 1. So I think that's a great honor for someone to be to be a part of that lineage that, that, that produces the, the savior of the world. So in the end, I believe uh, uh, God used her to bring uh, the Messiah into the world. Mm -hmm. Thank you for pointing that out. That's yeah. in Matthew. When we read the, uh, the lineage of Jesus, the, mm -hmm. uh, we see that her name is mentioned. And it even says Bathsheba, who was the wife of Uriah the Hittite. <laughs> God, yeah. make sure that we know she wasn't really David's wife. Yeah. Um, but God was able to use her to bring about the Messiah. She was yeah. the great, 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 great grandmother mm -hmm. of Jesus. And uh, what an honor, um, even through all of the pain and the suffering that mm -hmm. she had to go through. 
Yes, Nicole. Now, as you said, that it made me realize that although there may be consequences to our behaviors and consequences to our sin, there is a God who is willing to restore us mm -hmm. to where we, where we should be. Mm -hmm. And it just gives me hope that no matter what I do, as long as I am truly repentant and I really want Christ in my life, he is going to pursue me until he actually is able to, to, to save me in his kingdom. Amen. 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 Thank you for sharing that, Nicole. And what a wonderful way to, um, Shana, I'll have you share, and then we, we will need to wrap up. Go ahead, Shana. Um, just to add on to what Nicole was saying, um, even though we may have, or we do have to suffer the consequences of our actions, um, I'm reminded of Isaiah 54, verse 7, that says, For a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. And that's God's promise to us that even though we sin and, and cause great consequences for our actions, his mercies are just like unfathomable and unending. Amen. What a wonderful promise for us. And Pastor Derek, would you um, close in prayer for us sure. as we wrap up this lesson together? Thank you so much, uh, Brittany. What a great study. And thank you to each one of you for joining us uh, for mm -hmm. Hope Sabbath School today. Mm -hmm. And you're saying, oh, the immeasurable, unfailing love of God. And the answer is, that's the gospel the world needs to hear. Mm -hmm. But we need to hear it first in our own hearts mm -hmm. and to know that whatever mess we've made of our lives, that God can forgive us, cleanse us, Amen. and give us a new song to sing, Amen. a new life in Him. Let's wow. pray together. Mm -hmm. Our Father in heaven, thank you for the study today. Thank you for your grace, not only for King David, but for each one of us. Mm. And may we with thankful hearts surrender to your will and your way and bless you every day for your saving grace. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' name.